Thank you. Looking forward to today. Um, so a lot of times, I give a lot of talks these days, and a lot of times I walk around giving the same sort of stump pitch with minor variations on DevOps, and, and then it became on containers, and more recently it's become on microservices. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity because it's not. Uh, this is an opportunity for me to put together a brand new talk that's totally unrelated to the stuff I usually talk about. Um, and it's something that I'm very passionate about. I have a long background prior to 451, and alongside 451, I've been doing open source development myself for close to 15 years now. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, in and around uh, communities like Gentoo Linux and x.org um, and many others over the years. And the longer I'm around, the more passionate I become about the people um, and the community management part of things. And in fact, community management itself is a term I don't really like because trying to manage a community is almost impossible by definition. Uh, but trying to garden a community is something that's a little bit easier. Um, and so, like I said, I've been very passionate about this stuff because um, it's, it's the hard part, right? We can all, or not all of us, but many of us are developers. We have a pretty easy time writing code. Um, but what we have a lot harder time with is effectively collaborating um, and then figuring out how to cope with that collaboration you know, as, as open source projects get more and more popular, um, as you know, maybe the startup you're part of gets more and more popular, uh, it's important to remember the things that worked on day one are not going to work after year one, not going to work after year two. Um, and so you got to scale up the processes, scale up uh, the workflows as your stuff gets more and more popular. Um, and so that's a little bit of a backdrop. Um, now, in, in the Go context, um, my job is basically doing research on trends in tech, which is pretty cool. And so I spend most of my time uh, trying to dig up data, uh, trying to dig up examples of what's going on with some of these new technologies. Um, and Go is no longer new. Um, I was just having lunch with a couple of people who um, aren't part of the conference. I was having lunch about 10 minutes away from here. And they had never heard of Go before. right? Like, so however popular we think it is here, it's still new to most technologists in the world. And I was just talking to Dave right before this about you know, what could this conference do differently, what could this community do differently, and we heard some of this this morning um, as well, is make it easier for the new people. Because if you think about something, if, if a conference or if a community is growing 100% every year, then most of the people every single time are new to the community. Um, and how can you make it more welcoming to them? Um, and how can you convince them that Go is worth using compared to all the other alternatives, some of which have been around for a while and some of which are newer? Um, and so I've been, like I said, looking at Go for a couple of years now. Uh, two years ago, I was working at uh, another firm called Redmonk, doing a lot of research into developer trends and that sort of thing. Um, here's a post I wrote up at the time, which was like, hey, how about, here's Go. It's an overnight success that's been six years in the making. And now it's an overnight success that's been eight years in the making, and still people are hearing about it for the first time today. Um, and so this was the post that I wrote back then. Um, this was some stats that I was very proud when Rob used him on stage in his keynote at a previous GopherCon. I'm like, yes, Rob Pike is using my stuff. This is, this is a win right here. This is what success looks like. Um, at, and at the time, it's like, wow, Go is doing pretty well. It's picking up traction pretty fast. Um, and the question is, you know, two years down the road, uh, what's changed? Um, and what more can we dig into besides just looking at some straightforward stuff like commits and projects and contributors over time? Um, and so, before we get too much into the data, I want to talk a little bit about some things I've done before um, that brings us forward to the present. Um, so when I'm looking through data, whether it's data on coding, data on communities, data on anything else, um, I bring to it a certain philosophy. And I think it's three points that are really valuable to think about, right? A lot of them that apply to programming apply very well to thinking about community data just in the same way. Um, one is you know, you're going to get out what you put into it. And so if you pull out a bunch of metrics on what the community is doing, and those metrics are poorly collected or not reflective of the audience you're talking about, well, all the analysis in the world, all the fancy machine learning, whatever else you want to apply to it, aren't going to tell you a darn thing um, because they're not going to be reflective of what's really happening out there. Um, the second is, you know, I mentioned machine learning. Right? So if you want to get results that are full of artifacts and biases and weird stuff um, that you don't really understand how to interpret, then go ahead and use that brand new fancy natural language processing. Um, you know, throw some algorithms at it and see what comes out. Uh, but if you want to get some valuable insights quickly in a reasonable time frame, uh, just use the simple stuff. And so today, what I'm going to walk through is mostly using the simple stuff. Um, we could have spent all kinds of time. You know, I could have spent 25 minutes explaining the algorithms that I'm using to do this thing, but that's not a good use of time. Right? There's a lot you can get out of just looking at some data. Um, and, and finally, don't overinterpret. 
Um, and so, and this is a real big cautionary tale. Um, and I spent, like I said, I spent some time as an open source developer. Uh, prior to moving into tech full time, I was a full time scientist. I was doing biochemistry and drug discovery. Um, and so I've had a lot of experience in, in misinterpreting results and learning the hard way of uh, what not to do. And so that's the philosophy that I bring in to try and understand what's going on at the community. Um, so a couple of things that I've done prior to this. Uh, here's one looking at container traction over time. Like I said, I do these talks on containers and stuff pretty regularly. Um, and trying to quantify things, looking at things from different perspectives. Um, one of those perspectives of trying to get a handle for how things are doing is looking at what developers are talking about. And then the question, which we'll come back to later, is does that correlate to real world use? Because the first objection I always get is I say, oh, hey, here's what's popular on Stack Overflow. So that probably just means it sucks because people are asking so many questions about it. Right? It's just confusing and they can't get it. Um, and so I'll, I'll bring that back a little bit later. But here's one example of data from Stack Overflow saying, hey, containers are pretty popular. And it turns out they weren't popular until Docker was a thing. Um, people were using them before, but not a lot of people. Um, and then uh, in our competing talk down the hall, Kelsey is now talking about Kubernetes, so I don't need to talk to you anymore about it right now. Um, and one important point to bring it back to some of that philosophy stuff is you know, when you're trying to compare different technologies, today I'm going to talk about comparing some different sort of systems level languages. Um, it, it's really important to make sure you're comparing the same things. Um, you know, if you're trying to compare an entire community, an entire ecosystem around a language, to just a core implementation, uh, you're not going to get a lot of useful results out of that. Um, and so it's really easy to do the wrong thing, um, to do the wrong thing from a lot of different perspectives. Here's one other example where I learned something about that. Um, I was looking at config management, um, GitHub stars for pull requests over time, and saw some pretty puzzling stuff. Um, so if you look here, uh, you can see on the right you've got salt with some insane number of pull requests. And this is one of those things where once you get the data, you have to dig into it to understand all the weird stuff about it before you come out with what it means. Um, and so what I found from this was it turns out the Salt development process is different from all the other ones. Because everybody, even internally, even people who work at Salt Stack, uh, submit their own pull requests and accept their own pull requests. All right, so Thomas Hatch, who's the founder, he submits pull requests to himself and says, oh, cool, I'll take that one. That looks good. Um, and so you know, you got to make sure you understand what's going on with the data so you can effectively interpret it. Um, just some more random config management stuff I wanna, don't want to spend some, too much time talking about. Um, but so to get back to the point of this one, right? trying to understand how do we understand what's going on with the Go community in particular. Um, I'm just going to walk through a bunch of different data sources. And something that I hope you can take home from this today is not understanding this particular data set, but so you can take home a set of different tools and different approaches that you can apply to continue to look back at the health of either the Go community or any other community over time. Um, and so we're going to start first looking a little bit at what's going on in Core Go. Um, and then look a little bit more broadly at adoption of Go, the broader ecosystem around it, and the user base around it. Um, and so here is uh, some data from a site I really like called OpenHub. Um, it used to be Olo back in the day, and then Black Duck bought it and changed the name around. Um, super, super useful site if you're just trying to understand what's going on at the code base. Uh, it's free. You can submit arbitrary GitHub repositories to it, and it'll process them in a day or so, and you can come back and get all kinds of stats on what's going on with the code, uh, lines of code over time, commits over time, contributors over time, all this, all this cool stuff. Um, and so one, one snapshot of this that I think is really valuable um, is trying to understand what's the bus factor going on with some of these projects. Right? And bus factor, how many of you are familiar with that term? All right, about half maybe. OK, so, so for the other half, you know, the idea is, uh, so if you take the Linux kernel, for example, um, if Linus got hit by a bus tomorrow, what would happen to the development of Linux? Um, chances are it would slow down a little bit, but there are a couple of backup folks who could probably step up. And so if you've got a uh, robust leadership structure, whether that's in an open source project or in a company, um, then you have a much larger bus factor. The idea is how many people uh, would, you know, un unfortunately, tragically be hit by a bus before the project fails to work effectively. And so if you look at this, you can get a good feeling for how that looks over time. Um, so you've got those three charts up there of overall time, 12-month summary, and 30-day summary. And then the percentage of commits from basically the long tail versus um, the primary contributors. And you can see, uh, so in the 12-month, well, let's take, for example, you've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, 10 individuals um, who are contributing about 40% of the commits over time. Um, and the other 60% is, is comprised of the rest of the community. 
And you can see that no single person in there is committing more than about, uh, let's say, 15% at most. Um, thank you, Brad, for your excellent contributions. Um, and so if that disappears, just from a purely commit perspective, um, you'd still have the other 85% of the commits that kept on happening. Right? And so that's a pretty effective bus factor that's saying the community is pretty robust. Um, you can see, uh, in fact, though, compared to all time, it may have actually gotten a little bit less robust. Um, because more of the commits were made by um, a small number of individuals in the past 12 months compared to all time. And in the past 30 days, I, I don't want to get too far into that because usually the numbers are too small to be too meaningful. And that's where we get into that philosophy of like don't over interpret the results. Where if you're looking at 30 days worth of commits um, compared to all time, it's easy to say, oh, well, that's 53% compared to 40%. Uh, oh, the world is falling apart. Um, well, maybe, maybe not, because next month, chances are it's going to look totally different. Um, and so I think it's more valuable to look at the sort of 12-month um, rolling window compared to all time and not so much of that 30-day window. Um, so here's another piece of data from that same OpenHub site, uh, looking at contributors per month over time, um, over the past eight years now. And you can see, uh, it's pretty clearly, it's, it's a fairly linear graph. Right, and so you know none of that super cool exponential growth stuff. Um, it's not blowing up. It's not growing like 20% month over month or anything crazy like that. But it has grown, you know, at, at a noticeable, um, continual basis over the past eight years now, pretty consistently, um, which which is quite impressive. A lot of communities, you know, they grow to a certain point and then they kind of stall out. They grow to a certain point and they start shrinking. Um, and very, very rarely does it get to a point where you do see that kind of exponential growth, um, especially when you're talking. This is just for uh, let's Golang slash Go, right? This is just the repository for the core implementation. This isn't the whole ecosystem or anything like that. I'll show you some of that later on. Um, and so getting this many regular contributors to the language implementation itself is pretty impressive. I mean, you've got you know, close to 100 people here on a monthly basis who are all contributing to make Go a better language, which is pretty cool. Um, the thing to consider, though, is if you think about this from a, a rates context, um, how much percentage are things changing over time, you can see that it is slowing down, right? 10% growth uh, back in 2014 does not mean the same thing as 10% growth now, right? And so if you're increasing by a constant, uh, let's say, three new contributors every month, that's a smaller percentage basis when you get 90 people than it was back in those days when you had 30 people. And so that's something to think about is, what can we tie back to to make this actionable is the question um, that I was mentioning early on. How do you make it more welcoming for new contributors? Right? New people writing Go um, are actually the pipeline to becoming new core developers. And so as you make it easier for people to get started with Go, um, you can think about that as sort of a, like a sales funnel, if you're familiar with those. Right? Like what's the stepwise process people follow through from the point at which they start considering Go as a language to use for their toy apps or to use at work? Um, to the point at which they become a core developer? And how do you optimize each step of that process? Because each step of that process is somewhere where you're going to be losing potential contributors. Um, and if you can help that, you might see this change from, you know, let's say, three new core developers every month to maybe double that, if you're lucky. Um, and so I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about the sort of competitive landscape, if you will, of different systems languages. Um, these are the three I happen to pick for, for this example, uh, Go, Elixir, and Rust. If there are others, uh, like I said, my point from today is not just to show you some initial conclusions, but to give you a set of tools you can go back and look at. So uh, this is uh, a query I made on Stack Explorer, or sorry, Stack Exchange Data Explorer is what they call it, a freely available tool. Um, in fact, all of the queries from individual users, I think, are generally available. So if you want to, you can go look up my query and add another tag to it and just look at what that graph looks like. Um, so yeah, very valuable tool if you're trying to get a handle on uh, what kinds of discussions are happening around certain topics. Um, I use it a lot of times for you know, languages, for JavaScript toolkits, for container stuff like I showed you earlier on, for config management. Sort of take your pick of stuff. Um, if you've got enough discussion around it, you can, you can build some kind of trends. Um, you can even think about uh, one thing you can do on there is pull up the, the tag page itself. You probably haven't done this. Um, if you pull up the page for a tag on Stack Overflow, you can see a big listing of all the correlated tags um, by popularity. And a lot of them make sense, but every once in a while there's some surprises. Like apparently, um, I mean, Go goes really well with Mongo. Uh, which, I mean, I know they've got that really nice connector and everything, but it always surprises me when people focused around concurrency, you think about databases that are not known for doing so. 
Um, so to bring it back to this data, so we've got uh, basically developer discussions, tag questions per month over time in Stack Overflow, uh, Go versus Elixir versus Rust. No real surprises. I don't think you're shocked to hear that Go is doing a little bit better at present. Um, the question is more of uh, which way is the trending going? Uh, what should you be looking out for? And you know, if you're working on Go or if you're working with Go, um, what could you look at? What could you learn that you can take back from some of these other languages and apply to your own? I mean, if you look at uh, Something that's not on here, if you look at, at Node, for example, one of the reasons that Node, in my opinion, got really popular was that every new developer had the opportunity to do something really important, because the module ecosystem started out very uh, minimal. And so you know, it's one of those things that a lot of open source developers feel good about is, hey, I can make a difference here. Right? Like I can do something that tons of people use. It's going to get all kinds of adoption. Um, and so when you start out with a, a minimal core library, suddenly you get all these developers who come in and say, oh, I can, I can do networking. Right? Like everybody's going to use my, my router. Uh, it's going to be awesome. And so there's a lot of things, like I said, to learn from some of these other ecosystems. And looking at data like this is a good way to get a sense of which ones might have something you can learn from, particularly as it um, relates to trying to get more adoption. I'm um, trying to understand what influences adoption and how we can fix things to do a better job in the Go community. Um, and so you can see, you probably can't, you can't read the legend for this. Um, the data, so Go is on top in yellow. Uh, you've got in blue is uh, Rust and red is Elixir. And you can see that all three of them have you know, been trending upwards unsurprisingly. Seems like um, what's a little bit surprising to me is that Rust seems to have kind of stalled out over the past year despite coming out with 1.0. And so I'm not quite sure how to interpret that exactly. You know, I, I hesitate to go too far and trying to overinterpret what's going on there. Um, and then Elixir has been picking up quite a bit over the past year or so as well. And so here, like I promised you, we're going to tie discussion into real world usage. Um, six years ago now, uh, the site called Dataists came out with this post that just looked at language rankings on uh, GitHub, correlated them to language rankings on Stack Overflow. And turns out there's a pretty high correlation coefficient, uh, roughly 80%. Um, and so the discussion does, in fact, relate to real-world usage, um, especially real-world usage in open source communities, because we're talking about GitHub here. Um, if you're talking about enterprise, you're going to see you know, Java and C Sharp doing uh, even better than they are right now. But if you're talking about communities that are sort of predictive of the way technology is going, then I think Stack Overflow and GitHub are pretty good ones to look at. And uh, the Red Monk folks have done a very nice job over the past five years of regularly posting updates of this. Um, the one thing that you find over time is language usage doesn't change that quickly, um, and very few languages change over time. The only ones that I think have changed noticeably over the past five years, uh, Go is in fact one of them. It's Go and R and uh, I think Elixir was one of the third ones that was starting to pick up. But most of these languages, you know, people use them and they keep using them because it's what's easy. And that's, you know, coming back to that point about what's the funnel look like, what's the adoption funnel look like, well, people tend to do what's really easy, right? People tend to keep doing things if they work the way they always did because why fix it if it's not broken, right? I mean, that's not necessarily my philosophy, but that's the philosophy of a lot of people out there. Um, why should we pick up a brand new tool if the old one is working? And so the brand new tool has to be pretty darn compelling for somebody to decide it's worth dropping everything I've already learned, um, you know, throwing away all those sunk costs of knowledge, and deciding we got to go with something new. Um, but I, this thing, I think, is pretty powerful for showing you that when people talk about things, it, it means they really are using them. It doesn't just mean they're complaining more about them compared to something else. Um, it, it ties into at least open source usage. Um, enterprise usage is, is a different story and one that's a lot harder to get a handle on. So to go back to uh, our, our favorite site, OpenHub, your, your new friend when you're understanding human communities and trying to quantify them, I wanted to pull up a couple of examples, um, Go and Rust. Elixir, unfortunately, is still not considered a language by OpenHub, so I couldn't get that one up there. Uh, but if you look at, uh, let's see, on the left, you've got projects over time, then you've got contributors over time, then you've got commits over time from 2008 to 2016. And you can see. I'm sure you can see that there's an upward curve in all of them. You might not, might not be able to see the, uh, the numbers overall. On the top chart there, the numbers are ranging from 0 to 1% of total open source projects, right? So Olo, or sorry, OpenHub tracks something like uh, approaching a million different open source projects now, trawls all over GitHub, plus a bunch of other sources like the Apache Foundation and so on. 
And close to 1% of all of those projects right now um, are being created in Go. Close to 1%, actually a little bit more than 1% of all contributors are writing in Go. Um, close to 2% of all commits are happening in Go, the language, right? Not just Go, the core implementation anymore. Um, whereas if you, if you compare and contrast this against Rust, uh, what you see is it's, it's about around a quarter uh, to a fifth of the same traction, relatively speaking, uh, which is really, I mean, pretty surprising comparing how, how new it is and how uh, mature it is relative to Go. Um, it's picking up pretty quickly. But you can see that Go is, uh, like I said, doing pretty darn well. And you say back to me, but Donnie, 1% is not good. What are you talking about? Uh, did you find some good legal weed in Colorado? Uh, and I say to you, take a look at JavaScript, which is currently the most popular language on OpenHub, and look at its percentage. And what you'll see is that on a percentage basis, uh, for projects, it's about 8%. Contributors, about 8%. Commits, again, about 8%. So when you're comparing Go to JavaScript, the comparison point is 100% isn't the max. That'd mean you're dominating every language ever. The max is how is it doing compared to the most popular languages, right? You got to get the context right and compare to the right things. Um, and so if you compare Go to JavaScript, you see that you're talking roughly, um, let's say, 10%, maybe 15% as much adoption of Go happening today as there is a JavaScript, which is pretty darn impressive considering it's, uh, let's say, the, the overnight success that took eight years. So the ecosystem's doing all right, um, not just compared to newer stuff like Rust, but also compared to stuff that's been around and grown popular and in a huge, uh, huge variety of use cases like JavaScript. And so let's take a look at, at some other data. Um, this is from a site, again, another site that's a useful tool for you to go play with going forward uh, called Module Counts. Any of you seen this before? Awesome. Something new. Okay, so Module Counts is a site that does, um, unsurprisingly, what you may expect. It counts the number of modules that things have. And if you go to the site, it's got this interactive tool. Um, what they do is on a monthly basis count how many modules are in this language ecosystem. And it, I think they track about 15 different ones now, all the way from uh, you know, things like CPAN and NPM down to stuff like uh, crates for Rust. Uh, and so based on the three that I kind of picked out, you got Rust, Elixir, Go, um, you can see that Go is doing pretty darn well. And those other ones are somewhere down there in the noise. Right, so there's a ton of people building out Go packages, publishing Go packages. Um, I mean, you're talking, what's 125,000 on that graph right now? Do you know if that's up to date? Anybody? It could be the dip. Yeah, so to repeat the question for the recording, um, so one thing that they did recently was they pruned out a bunch of packages that seemed like inactives or duplicates. Um, and it could be that dip at the end there that looks like roughly a 10% drop or so. Does that seem reasonable? I thought it might be bigger, but if, if that's what you good. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to keep tabs on that going forward. But yeah, this is a really nice site for trying to track you know, how the ecosystem is growing over time um, compared to whatever else is going on out there. And again, I think the importance is, how do we get the context right? Because right? these may be what you think of as potential alternatives, potential substitutes for Go. Uh, but when you've got people who are external to this whole ecosystem coming into it, it may not be the same way they think about it. Right? They might be thinking about different choices based on where they're coming from and what they're using today. They might be thinking about, hey, I'm a, I'm a Java developer today. I'm writing systems in Java. Uh, I heard about this Go thing. It sounds like it's pretty cool. Um, or they might be coming from Python land or whatever else. And so. Just to get a better handle on some of this, I took off Go so that you could see all that stuff that's way down there in the noise and you can't really interpret. Um, and you can see in yellow there is Rust, and uh, in blue is, is Elixir and Erlang. And you can see that uh, the two are growing at very different paces, right? which uh, pull us back to some of the other data correlated together. You can see, uh, at least in my opinion, you've got some conflicting information going on. Because some of the other data suggests that Elixir is growing faster than Rust, um, but this one says, oh, well, Rust's getting more packages. And I think this is one of those things where you get back to that question of, are we comparing apples and oranges here? Um, because if you look at what the standard package looks like in different languages, it's not always the same thing. And it's really hard to normalize for that. Um, so if you look at you know, 
what does a package look like in Python versus what does a package look like uh, in NPM land where, you know, left pad is a thing. You know, you come up with very different definitions. And so numbers to numbers is not always the right comparison. You have to take into mind, well, how do we get a good sense of how to do these comparisons? And this is something I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about, but I think the right approach is rates. Um, looking at velocity over time, percentage change month over month, year over year, um, rather than looking at absolute numbers over time. And I didn't have a chance to get to uh, all of the rate stuff I was hoping to, um, but if you can make some basic calculations off the top of your head, um, just kind of look at this graph of like, well, so between July and October, let's see, we've got Rust going from about uh, 2,500 packages to 3,000 packages. All right, you're talking about an 18% growth rate in three months. Um, compared to you know whatever else, so I, th I think rates is going to be the right kind of approach to take, um, rather than trying to think about it in terms of absolute values, because um, you really care about not where is something today, but where is it going to be in the future. Um, and so again, thinking about context in a little bit different way. So in the last one, we just had Rust and Elixir. The one before that, we added Go, um, and now we said, oh well, what about that other stuff? Because it turns out there are a few things that are more popular. So here's the MPM one I was talking about. Right? And if you put that on there, it really brings you some context. Like, turns out that Go may not be the most popular language ever. I don't think this is a surprise for anybody, because the point is not be the most popular language. The point is be the right tool for the right job. Um, and so the question is, what is the right job for Go? Um, where is it the perfect fit? Maybe it's not the perfect fit in quite as many places as Node is. Um, and that's totally fine, as long as it does the right thing and does it very well. Um, but so if you look at, at Node, um, what you can see here is a pretty nice example of that exponential growth. Um, if you did a you know, rate calculation on that, you'd get something that was a pretty constant percentage basis instead of something that's a gradually decreasing percentage basis like you see when you've got a linear growth on there. Um, and so the question, again, is you know, what is the real competitor? What is the real option? And how do you make that actionable? I think how you make that actionable is figure out where are your new developers coming from, and how do you build the right sets of tools, the right sets of documentation, the right kinds of tutorials um, that help them understand, like, hey, I was writing Java before, now I'm going to write Go. Um, what are the parallels here, right? What am I coming into you know, from a land where imports are like 800 characters long? Um, you know, how do I think about concurrency differently than I was in Java? How do I think about async differently than I was in Java land? Um, and so I think it's worth considering, you know, and, and you might even be interested in running something like, like a developer survey of asking your community, hey, where are you coming from? What were you doing before this? And what made you decide Go is the right thing to do? Um, because as much as I feel like surveys are incredibly biased, they can provide some information you can't really get from anywhere else. Um, and so one other data point that I wanted to pull in here uh, was the Stack Overflow developer survey um, on the topic of surveys. They do what I think is the biggest developer survey in the world. Uh, in the last one that they came out with earlier this year, it was something like 50 or 55,000 people responded, um, which is a pretty decent sample size. You believe, like, hey, that probably is reasonably representative of what's going on in software development out there. And from the Go perspective, um, unfortunately, it didn't show up on a lot of those top technology stuff um, because it's popular, but it's not top 10 popular. Right? It's more like top 25 popular if you think about all the different languages and, and technologies and you know, stuff that's got Hacker News all riled up like React or uh, Vue or that kind of thing. Um, but where it does show up is in what people love, what people really enjoy using, what they want to keep using in their next job, that sort of thing. And so one of the questions they ask is, what are you using now and what do you, what do you want to keep using? And in that question, Go actually did really well. It's up here, it's uh, number five on that list, if you can't read it from the back. And so you can see, in, in fact, what was also surprising, too, is um, Rust did even better. Right? And so that brings the question of, well, what could we go and learn from Rust that might help us become a, a more lovable, more huggable language? Uh, because the gopher alone doesn't quite get you there as much as I wish it did. It's a good starting point, don't get me wrong. Um, but when you see that kind of 10% uh, or so difference, you feel like there's something they're doing that's really significantly better than even some of the other most popular, most loved tools out there. And on the flip side, I'm not going to show you the most hated list, but uh, I don't think there would be a whole lot of surprises on there in terms of things like COBOL. 
Um, and now to, to tie this back into some of those percentage arguments about what's going on with the ecosystem, what's going on with the modules. Um, here's another data point from that same Stack Overflow survey. Um, again, I don't expect you to be able to read all of those. Uh, but what this is is looking not just at the people who answered the survey, um, but looking across all of Stack Overflow, the site, and looking at changes in the number of votes for certain technologies, certain languages year over year. Um, so from 2015 to 2016, what were people voting for back then? What are people voting for now? And what changed? And there's not a ton of surprises at the very top of the list. You got stuff like React and like Spark and Swift. Um, no, no big shocks up there. Um, but I did want to point out that the very last one on the list of something that was still growing uh, was Go. Right? Which is sort of encouraging. You know, there's always room to get better when you're not growing as fast as you used to. Um, and the question is one of, you know, do you feel like you've won yet? Right? Like, is, have you fulfilled the niche that you aim to fill around you know, being really good at writing cloud infrastructure, basically? Um, or do you feel like there's more opportunities to grow there? And if you feel like you're done, then 2%, you 5% know, growth rate year over year is fine. Um, but if you feel like there's things that need to change, things that need to improve, more adoption to gain, um, well, then, you know, the question is, what can you do to get farther up that graph uh, without getting lost in too much buzzword super and microservices and, and serverless and all that good stuff? Um, but the point is, it's, it seems like it's getting mature from sort of an external point of view. Um, and as languages mature, um, unsurprisingly, people start getting paid more and more to work on them. And, you know, I think two years ago, it would have been really interesting to talk about, like, hey, there are companies using Go in production. That's so crazy and cool. Uh, and, put, and put some logos up on the screen. This year, I'm not going to do that. Um, but instead, what I thought I'd show you is uh, there's uh, this guy, Ryan Williams, that trawls through Hacker News and looks for jobs that get posted, uh, mentioning certain technologies and languages. And he's got a nice little site where you can plug them in. And so I went back, did the same old thing that I've been doing before, took Go, Elixir, and Rust, and popped them up on a graph. And you can see on a monthly basis for, uh, this is the past three years now, um, you can see there's a reasonable number of posts happening every month that are looking for Go coders. Not as many as you would hope for. Um, and I didn't, there are other you know, job search sites you can go do this on. Uh, I think you can do it on uh, Indeed and uh, one or two others where you can actually get graphs and, and trawl through the database over time instead of just seeing job results. Um, but you can see that things are going in an upward trend, um, especially over the past nine months or so. Things have kind of spiked up. Now, I don't want to pull too much interpretation out of this again, because we're talking, uh, you know, the, the numbers are not huge. Um, I mean, on a percentage of total posts happening on Hacker News, we're talking you know, sub 2%. Um, so it's not a ton of stuff. But it does show you some kind of a broad trend of that upward curve that you'd like to see. Um, and it does show you Go continues to get a lot more jobs being posted than Elixir, and, and certainly so than Rust. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you, and uh, I may or may not do an interactive demo of this. I think it's a really cool site. Um, so there's this startup called uh, Biturgia. And they do a lot around trying to do community analytics. Um, they even like sell something as a service, or they'll, you can pay them a bunch of money and they'll stand it up for you. Uh, but one thing that's really nice about it is um, it, they rebuilt their stuff. It's all on the Elastic stack now. And you can just stand up basically a Kibana instance um, and throw your GitHub at it. And they've got a site where you can do it for free called uh, cauldron.io, which is, this data is from. So this is just this kind of a screenshot from a Kibana dashboard. Um, taking a look at all these different metrics over the past five years of not Corgo, um, but it does it at the level of uh, sort of a username or group. So everything within the Golang group on GitHub over the past five years. And on here, I don't, again, expect you to be able to read all of this stuff. But you've got uh, commits over time in the top left, Git authors over time in the top right, issues over time in the middle left, um, the time open for issues in the middle right. Um, and on the bottom right, left and right, you got uh, pull requests over time, and then the time open for pull requests. Um, and so there's a lot of different things you can do with these metrics to get a good sense of um, how good of a job you're doing at managing the community effectively. Um, and especially, you know, if, you, if people file issues and you leave them sitting there for like six weeks before a response, well, chances are they're never going to want to become a developer. Um, they're not going to be too interested in contributing if they feel like their concerns are being unheard, if they feel if, like they wrote a big patch and it doesn't happen. Um, and you know, this goes beyond the question of, like, hey, we've got a bot that responded to it, to having actual humans involved. Um, because it turns out empathy is a thing and relationships are a thing. 
I mean, in fact, you know, a lot of people involved in open source projects, myself included, will stick around for years after they feel like that project is particularly useful to them just because they built such a great community and don't want to move on. Um, so, like I said, the site's cauldron.io. I think you get like one repo for free that's a custom one or one project for free. But then the other thing you can do is you can trawl through everybody else that's created a, a dashboard against any other open source project. And so a lot of the popular ones are already on there. Uh, so you can go, like I said, dig through this. Um, there's tons of different stats on there. And get a good sense of you know, how your community is doing and how it compares to other communities. Basically, what are, I hate the, word, the phrase best practices, because it usually means most common practices and not the best practices. Um, but you can get a sense of what the real best practices are. And you can get a good sense of how you're doing, and not just how you're doing today, but have you effectively improved things over time? Um, whether that's for you know, internal projects, or for Go, or for anything else you're working on. Um, so like I said, it's, it's a really cool site, and I definitely recommend signing up for it. And if uh, you go on there now, they have to have an invitation code. Uh, you can use OSCON16. It still works. I did it yesterday. So just a little tip there. Or you can search Twitter for codes, and I'm sure that I'll pop it up too. Um, so I think this is you know, a lot of these other tools um, people have come across, at least some people have come across in terms of things like OpenHub, um, things like uh, module accounts, maybe a little bit less so. Um, this is something I usually, when I tell people about this, everybody's shocked because nobody's ever heard about it. Um, and a lot of people, in fact, have spent a fair amount of time building out their own custom Kibana dashboards just so they can track this stuff effectively. Um, so it's, it's definitely worth taking a look at um, if you're interested in you know, understanding what's going on with the code or with the people in any community. Um, and so, let's see, we've got a few minutes left, so I wanted to talk about one last topic. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that I think rates are really important when you're trying to understand what's going on in the community. It's, it's really about looking at rates. And it turns out looking at rates is pretty hard. Um, so looking at rates, uh, let's take this as a sample data set of something going on at the community over time. Uh, it's kind of spiky, kind of noisy. If you do a straight up numerical differentiation of this, it's going to look like crap, because you're going to have rates going essentially from like negative to positive infinity um, on the same graph. And so you're going to get zero value out of it. And so you get to this question of, all right, so how do you even understand how to get a rate, much less doing something useful with it? Um, and so I came across, I spent a long time trying to dig into this. I um, finally came across this paper from uh, this guy, Rick Chartrand, who uh, works at Los Alamos. Um, Highly recommend this paper. This, this stuff's all going to be up on SlideShare, by the way, so you don't need to like, write any of this down if you were thinking about it. Um, came across this paper that the guy does a really nice job of doing some good smoothing, because um, trying to get smoothing that works effectively for noisy data like this is, is actually really challenging. Um, and then trying to get a rate uh, smooth data can also produce its own set of artifacts. Um, and so I thought I'd show you a few different examples of different ways people calculate rates today and how that works when you get noisy data. And almost every time when you look at community data, what you get is noisy data. Um, you get things, especially like if you're looking on like a month-to-month -month basis, you get stuff like, uh, so we had uh, 27 pull requests last month and like 640 this month and then 327 last month uh, or you know, the month after that. And it's really hard to get a sense of, well, how do I display that effectively? How do I interpret that effectively? Um, obviously, the answer is smoothing. And the question is, well, how do you do it right and in a way that doesn't force you to kind of sit there in front of a spreadsheet for hours and hours and hours? Um, and so you know, if you take a few different methods and apply this, this is just sort of straight up numerical differentiation. Like I said, it, it looks basically impossible to interpret and do anything useful with. Um, if you do something a little bit fancier, uh, you get something that works a little bit better. Uh, but really, what you're looking for is something that shows you, hey, here's exactly what's happening, right? It's going down at a slope of negative 1, then it's going up at a slope of 1. We should have something that looks you know, very blocky in nature. Um, and so that's exactly what the method that, that was in this paper, which I thought was super cool. Um, so you came up with this nice, nice smoothing methodology um, that gives you something that looks exactly the way you want it to. Um, and so if you're thinking about doing anything with community-based metrics, um, I think rates are the right way to go, and I think this is the right way to do rates. Um, so I just thought I'd pass that along in case any of you were interested in playing around. Um, and so with that, you know, I think we're about 10 minutes early, which is awesome, uh, because that leaves us plenty of time to talk about um, any questions you may have. So thank you.
very, thank you very much, Donny. We have two microphones, uh, one in this aisle, one in the other one. If you can, if you make your way to the microphone, feel free to introduce yourself and ask your question. Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Suresh uh, from Connecticut. Um, sometimes internally in companies, uh, you'll have robot users that automatically commit something on a regular basis. Yeah. Do you have any idea how often that happens in the open source world, and how does that affect your analysis of commit data? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely something that you have to be able to correct for. Um, and so, you know, you might be able to, if you're using Git, um, you can run it through a Git filter and just produce, uh, you know, a derivative repo that you use for the analysis, um, which is probably the way I would recommend going about it. But yeah, it's, when you try and apply these kinds of methods in bulk to a large number of communities, you're always going to end up with weird artifacts like that. And so it's really important that, you know, whatever kinds of results you're getting out of it, you look at the data and try to understand where that data came from, um, especially if it looks a little bit weird. And so, like, for example, this is trivial to get a sense of if you just rank the individual contributors, right? And if you've got a robot in your top 10, that's probably something you should correct for. Um, if you've got a robot that's doing 1% of the commits, it's probably something you don't really care about. Um, and so, you know, you just got to be able to look at the data and, and interpret it effectively rather than trying to, uh, you know, treat it as a black box, because I, I don't think that'll effectively work. I mean, it's, I think the question on, on bots is actually a good one because, you know, they're getting a lot more popular as more and more people start using, uh, whether, whether it's uh, stuff like Garrett or whether it's, uh, you know, a lot of uh, CI, CD tooling um, is doing more and more commits created by bots for one reason or another. Um, I mean, you might have a bot that just runs GoFormat or something, and you're like, wow, that bot committed a whole lot of code. Nice job. I'm like, well, yeah, but uh, didn't, I mean, it did something useful for readability, but it just broke all the diffs from everybody else, so. Um, yeah, you just got to look at the data and make sure you're not letting those artifacts screw you up as much as you can. Any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your fees. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Would you feel comfortable in estimating the size of the number of Go programmers out there? The size of what? Like, I've seen a very old stat from a couple of years ago that there are somewhere around 18 million, it was either programmers in general or oh. Java programmers. Yep. Do you reckon you could make yeah. a guess? Yeah, good question. Um, so I actually did a, a projection on that uh, about a year and a half ago based off of GitHub growth. Um, and when I saw that GitHub had reached, I think it was like three and a half million users at the time or something, um, turns out there's some pretty nice algorithms for understanding uh, um, the growth of a social network over time as it pertains to the maximum size of the network and as, you know, diffusion of innovation is actually what it's called. Um, and so if you apply that kind of algorithm, what I came up with was roughly 25 million. Um, now the question is, is that really the full um, global population of developers or is that just the current accessible network and there's a separate segmented network elsewhere, which I suspect is more likely the case, um, especially once you start getting people who don't program natively in English. Mm -hmm. um, so like looking at the Chinese population of developers is something that we may be missing entirely. I spoke with a guy from China um, a couple years back at a conference and he said he ran the largest developer forum in China and that forum alone had something like 25 million registrants. So, you know, that's the number I've got. I hear numbers ranging between 20 and 30 million from different folks. Uh, 25 is what I've got right now. I'm not super confident in it, but I don't think we're ever going to reach all of them anyways. So, you know, theoretical discussion. Awesome. All right, one more question. One last question. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's very data focused. I was wondering if, in addition to this, you've ever done sentiment analysis on postings about languages. Uh, so I haven't done that with languages. Let me see. I have done it. Um, let's see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Uh, sentiment analysis, again, is one of those, it's a hard problem to do well. And it's one of those places where it's very easy to get all kinds of artifactual results in there because um, 
you know, people use words that don't mean what you think they mean, or they talk about somebody else's negative post, and so you classify that as a negative post too. Um, so there's all kinds of weird issues there. But one thing I did a couple years back was, uh, like I said, I was, I've been involved in X.org over the years. And uh, as a consequence of that, I idled in the IRC channel and logged it all over the course of uh, about nine years. And so I ran some sentiment analysis over all of that to see how it went. And some, that uh, sort of a constant negative over time um, constant positive over time and a constant, uh, and just a question of traffic over time in general, which is not sentiment. Um, and you know, you can, you can get some results out of that. You can see from this, the blue and the green lines are uh, reasonably consistent over time. I had to apply a lot of smoothing to get anything that looked halfway normal out of it. Um, I think there is value in it. Something that I've always wanted to do is try and do um, sentiment across issues and see if you can get a sense of developers who are handling issues poorly based on the kinds of sentiment they're using in their posts. Essentially, like if you're calling somebody who files an issue a jerk, or if you're saying, like, get out of here, what are you doing? Um, that's probably not the developer you want to be interfacing with your user base. Um, so I'd love to do that kind of thing, but I haven't done it yet. But I have, I have played around with some of it. Um, I have a certain sentiment dictionary that I use for this. Uh, and if you want to look it up, it's uh, in a repo called Bluebird. You can go find it. There's a sentiment dictionary in there and some R code that may or may not still work today. It's been a couple of years. Yeah, it's definitely something that's worth playing around with, but it's something that's, uh, like I said, the more complex you get, the more difficult it gets to interpret it. All right, thanks for uh, coming, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Donnie.